What a blessing to be in God's house. The Baptist Church on Witcher Creek. It's preaching time with Pastor Randy Wilson. Sing here every Sunday. Good job. It's preaching time. Are you ready? Probably ought to buckle your seatbelt, isn't it? In the book of Genesis, chapter 15, I want to get right into this. This may be, as I was looking at it, this may be one of the most important messages that you'll ever hear in your life. You think about what I just said. This may be one of the most important messages. It will help you if you will listen to it. And then you've got my failures. Uh, if I can get it, to, get it to do what the Lord spoke to my heart, Brother Ike, about it doing it'll maybe help you to be able to be a stronger Christian. How many of you would like to be a stronger Amen. Christian? Amen. Amen. We've been studying uh, the way from Egypt to Canaan. And we got at Mount Sinai and we got the, uh, the covenant of the law. Later we'll get the Palestinian covenant where they went into the land but then I've, I've, I've reverted back because we have a covenant there on the wall that we've almost forgotten, but it's still there. And as Baptists, we probably ought to read that every once in a while and see what uh, we've kind of promised each other. I know it's a man's covenant. I already covered that, didn't I? Yeah. That even though it's a man's covenant, you can't disannul it. Amen. Once it's done, once you've said it, it's better to not vow a vow than it is to vow one and break it. Now I want to talk about the father of the covenant. The father of the faithful is a, is a man named Abraham. And I want to preach about him this morning. Genesis chapter 15. I'm just going to jump in there at verse 5. This is Abraham that he brought forth. It said, He brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. Amen. Simply believed, had faith in what God told him, and God counted that as he was righteous. He said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said unto him, Take me a heifer of three years old, a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these and divided them in the midst and laid each piece one against another. But the birds divided he not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a strange land, in a, in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. And afterwards shall they come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy father in peace, thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. And in the same day, the Lord made a covenant, you see that, with Abram, 
saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the river, great river, the river Euphrates. Our Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd help us as we go to preach today. Lord, I pray that, that we could be of benefit to someone, real benefit in their life that would value for eternity. Help us to preach today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, if I can fill you in on what's going on him, Lot had been taken captive, kidnapped, and, and Abraham had, had armed his men and, and rescued him. And uh, after all the accolades and shaking everybody's hand, everybody left. Lot went right back to Sodom. What a sorry thing to get rescued and then go right back in the same hole that you got rescued from. And I think the king of Sodom must have been stupid because he had an opportunity to have a great reward, but he didn't take it. Melchizedek was gone. Hey, just a set of sweet memory of that high priest and king of God that came to visit him. And uh, I think the, the soldiers, those uh, that was 300 that he they armed in, he said they probably left thinking themselves to be Green Berets or something, you know. And it's God that gave them the victory. I said that to say this, Abraham is left all alone. There is nobody around and, and nobody to to reassure this man. And God said, uh, Abraham, I promised you, Abram, I promised you a child. Well, he said, I know you did. I ain't seen nothing. You ever been there? I know you promises, but uh, uh, so far, uh, we're not doing real well with that. Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 6 says, It's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by my spirit. I'm the one that's going to do this, Abram. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And though he was alone, uh, and uh, uh, though he was still on earth, yet he had God in heaven as his God. God was still his rock, he was his sword, he was his shield, he was his wheel in the middle of a wheel. And uh, uh, he had Melchizedek's prayers and blessing. He was not only a priest, but he was a king. And Abraham said, I appreciate that, but I'd sure like to see something about this promise. I don't need money. I don't need prestige. I don't need cattle. What I need is a seed. You promised me one. I'm childless. My heir's a servant from Damascus. But you promised me a seed. And God said, I want you to go out and I want you to look up. Look as far as you can. Count as many stars as you can. Count the sand on the seashore. And Abraham believed God. He believed God when he didn't have nothing. To believe except the promise of God. Business is going to pick up whenever we believe the promises of God. God talks to him about a seed. And he really is not talking so much about the many seeds as he's talking about this one seed that's going to come. And God is getting ready to show him something. And I think when we look about this sun going down and the deep sleep there in verse 12 that fell upon Abram and lo, a horror of great darkness. You see that? God's getting ready to show him about Calvary. He's got a heifer there. He's got a goat. He's got a ram. He's got a pigeon. He's got a dove. Every one of them are pictures of Jesus. In some way or another, from the strength of the heifer to the 
harmlessness of the dove. They're all pictures of Jesus. And of course, whenever they got the sacrifice lined up, the fowls come down to, uh, to destroy them and Abram fought them off. He drove them away. If you follow fowls through the Bible, they're always a picture of wickedness. From, that, from them that eat the baskets off of Pharaoh's butler's head till that supper of the great God that's coming uh, in the future, they're all pictures of wickedness. But when the sun went down that day, a sleep fell on Abram. But it wasn't a peaceful sleep. Well, you know, we think sometimes when, when we go to sleep, well, that means peaceful. But actually, he's got a nightmare that's going to go on. There's a great terror that takes hold of Abram in that sleep. And Here's the plan, he said. There's going to be a darkness fall on my son Jesus. There's going to be a darkness fall on you. Christian, there's going to be a darkness fall on you. I don't understand that. The Bible said that after all that Joseph had done, that it wound him up in a prison house. And then Joseph had victory. What What we've got is the cost of the covenant. When Jesus, uh, 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 when his uh, precursor uh, of the cross was shown to him and the deep dark waves of God's wrath rolled over Jesus' soul, there is a cost to being in the covenant. Did you ever hear about the permissive will of God? God allows things and I cannot explain why. Why couldn't they just continue to prosper? I mean, Joseph was in charge. Everything was happy. Why did we have to have 400 years of darkness? He said there in verse 13 and 14, your seed will be allowed to be afflicted in a strange land. And how many times have we in our Christian life when we start out as young Christians and boy, we're going along fine, we're doing just like Joseph and then a circumstance arises that Joseph has nothing to do with and all we see is a deep dark night in our soul. Amen, preacher, I've been there. All we see is darkness. I don't understand why that has to be. God said that's the way it is. That's the way the plan works. The permissive will of God is always seems, seems to me that's what people always question. Why did this have to happen? I don't, I don't understand it. I wish I had, you know, some pat answers like Dr. Phil and tell you all you got to do is take two of these. But, but I, I do not have those answers. Yeah. But I know that Abraham had that same problem. Yeah. When that terror seized on his soul, God said, that's coming. And I believe God has a purpose in that. And he said, there in Egypt, there in that furnace, I will make, I will form the nation. And the same God, that arranged for them to go to Egypt, arranged for them to come out of Egypt. That's what I want you to understand. The same God that allows you to go through the troubles and trials of life has already made preparation that when whatever the purpose is, maybe it's the iniquity of the Amorites. I don't know what the purpose is, but I know whenever that comes to the full, it's like a rise in the water. It's going to overflow. God said, that's enough. I'm going to bring them out from there. I think about uh, uh, God's uh, will being a two-edged sword. God raised up Pharaoh. 
Raised him up for a couple of purposes. Most people just think he raised him up to destroy him. But God raised him up to give him an opportunity to repent. Because he actually went to him and said, I'm telling you, let my people go. But Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey him? Scripture told Pharaoh that God was bigger than him. But Pharaoh didn't believe it. And most people in America don't. Most people in America think America is bigger than God. Or most people in America think the Republican Party or the Democratic Party or the Communistic Party or whatever party you want to go to is bigger than God. Most people think that God is limited and can't do anything. A covenant is an agreement. And God said, the darkness is coming. I don't know why. I don't know why that had to be. I'll, I'll tell you something. Now, Jesus didn't even know why it had to be. You say, "Oh, now wait a minute, preacher." You want me to show you? Jesus said in the garden, before he faced the darkness, "Father, if it be Thy will, let this cup pass from me." Nevertheless, I like that. Amen. Not my will, but Thy will be done. Whenever tragedy strikes you, whenever some uh, terror takes hold of your soul, whenever your heart's broken and it looks like it won't ever be mended again, I'm glad to report that God knows all about it. It didn't slip up on God. God knows what's going on and God's already laid the plans for a deliverance. I I don't know how long it'll be, but I know, thank God, one of these days a a deliverance will come. A covenant is an agreement between people. Abraham and God made an agreement. And then, uh, uh, can I say there's a parallel uh, uh, with that covenant right there on the wall. We make an agreement, uh, uh, but there is an uh, intervening hindrance. Whenever we stand and testify, Lord, I'm going to serve you. Church, y'all just, I'm serving notice on everybody that I am going, it's going to be easy street from now on. From now on, I'm going to serve God and nothing's going to be able to hinder. But I want you to know there is a hindering force that is real. Satan is real and he desires to put you in bondage just like he desired to put Israel in bondage. Satan not only works in national politics. Amen. I think that national politics is a good example of his work in But do you know Satan actually works in the lives of church people? Smack that sucker sitting beside of you. He's part of the problem. No, I'm no, no, Mike. That's your mommy. Three tools that Satan uses to, to bring darkness on the church people is the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. When Christians turn from godliness to the beggarly elements of the world, there is an immense reproach that's brought upon the whole house of God. Whenever we allow Satan to bring darkness into our life and then that darkness into the church, it's it's a tremendous dishonor to God. And it's a hindrance to the church. When Christian families fall apart, Christian families wind up in the divorce court. Tremendous. That green-eyed monster of jealousy and envy and selfishness, it grieves the Holy Spirit of God and prosperity of the entire church is hindered because of it. Achan brought defeat to the whole nation. And the, the church covenant declares us to be one body in Christ, doesn't it? So if we're one body in Christ, then that means if one part of our body hurts, one part of our body is harmed, then the whole body suffers for it. You ever have a little sore on your toe? Your hand will sympathize with it. 
course, if youth and zeal, you know, and I remember I used to be a young preacher full of zeal, and we're going to fix everything. And there wasn't nothing wrong going to go on in my church. Are you crazy? What you do, you go in there sawing limbs off. Then directly you realize, hey, that's my hand. I needed that. In every church, there are some self-appointed critics. Amen. Amen. Servants of the devil, agitated by the devil. And uh, many a church has had that dark experience that Abraham had just because of the selfishness of some people. Am I preaching right? Amen. 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 Believe it or not, I read your whole book last night. And I had this sermon before I ever read the book. Spirituality needs promoted. Amen. Spirituality is emotional, but it's not necessarily emotional, spiritual. How do, let me say that again. Spirituality is emotional, but emotions are not necessarily spirituality. What I'm saying is I have seen people Stand up and praise God and cuss their neighbor before they sit down. Yeah, amen. amen. I have seen people that have come to the house of God and, and they act like, well, they're living at the foot of the cross and they don't get across the bridge until they're backbiting. And, am I telling it right? Uh, uh, emotionalism isn't necessarily spirituality. No, I'm an emotional preacher. I remember Mount Carmel when they got real emotional. But it wasn't spiritual. In Acts chapter 19, the whole city, the whole city for two hours went to shouting. Yeah, yeah. But they were shouting for the wrong God. Amen. Right. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Tears are not even spiritual. Yeah. You say, oh, well, Peter, sh-. yeah, he did. Yeah. But they weren't because he was so happy. Yeah. Amen. Those tears were because he was convicted. Of what he done. I think spirituality is the development whereby the man or the woman desires to do the will of God even if it is dark. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. See, it's, it's easy to serve the Lord in the sunshine. Yeah, amen. It's easy to shout in the church house. Yeah. And whenever the things gets dark, amen, like Jesus had in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he prays for an out. Uh, when the things gets dark, uh, it'll, uh, uh, spirituality uh, is when you manifest love, joy, peace, long suffering, even though it's dark. Amen. Yeah. Amen. That's right. Amen. Gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. The nine graces of the Galatians 5 are the expression of spirituality. The very first one was love. Amen. And I certainly don't want to sound like Joel Osteen. But I'm telling you the most important thing you can do is love your neighbor. Amen. Am I telling it right? Amen. Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples. When we cultivate love in our neighbor, when we cultivate peace and long-suffering and gentleness uh, and we feed them and water them uh, and our love for God grows, uh, our emotions of joy and peace uh, uh, will come naturally. I'm glad, thank God I'm glad that I got joy, 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 joy down in my heart. If we live in the Spirit, let's walk in the Spirit. Peter knew what spirituality was whenever he said you need to add some things to your faith. Second Peter chapter 1, Let me, let's turn over there just a minute. Second Peter chapter 1. talks in verse 4 there about the, the exceeding great precious promises of God that you would be a partaker of divine nature and you escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. Then he said, besides all this, giving all diligence to add to your faith. Somebody said, well, faith's all I need. Faith will get you saved. But you need to add to your faith virtue and the virtue knowledge. 
and the knowledge temperance, and temperance patience, and the patience godliness, and the godliness brotherly kindness, and brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they may you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful. In the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. And you know what it says in the next verse? It says you can actually forget that you're yeah. saved. Amen. Did you know that? Right. Look at it. You say, oh, preacher, I don't believe it. Look what it says. For if these things be in you and abound to make you so feel neither bad nor for, uh, or unfruitful, but he that lacketh these things is blind, cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. He forgot that he was clean. Yeah. Hallelujah. I want to keep in mind that the blood of Jesus has washed my sins away. I don't want to ever forget that I am a child of God and should act like a child of God. Our covenant promises us, or we promise the church that we'll be promoting spirituality around here. We are to cooperate in our worship, in our work, in our evangelism, in our soul winning. Prosperity comes first through, can I say this, through hard work. Salvation comes through faith. But you know what Abraham did? He believed God. But then when the fowls come down, he beat them off. Verse number 9, back in Genesis chapter 15. The fowls, he, he expelled them. He, he pushed them out. Pushed the devils out. And prosperity not only comes through hard work and sacrifice, but prosperity comes through suffering. At verse number 12, there was a terror came upon him. Uh, horror and great darkness fell on him. Prosperity comes if you'll endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. The problem of it is we run well for a while. Amen, preacher. Good job amen. preaching. Amen, amen, amen. We'll run well for a while, but when hard times falls on us, we fall away. Amen. Prosperity comes by, by suffering. Genesis 15, 6, salvation comes by faith. Genesis 15, 15, even though you got all that, Abraham, I'm going to take care of you personally. I like that. That tells me that God's going to take care of me personally. And though all of these problems and troubles are rising, son, I've had them. Don't you think I haven't had them? Hey, you don't pastor a Baptist church for near 40 years and not have a problem. I'm talking about Baptists. But through it all, over yonder on the other side of the river, 